Okay, well, let's get started. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Sources of Real-World Data, Patient-Reported Outcomes Collected During Routine Healthcare Delivery. Um, I am um, happy to welcome you to this webinar. Next slide, please, so, uh, Sarah. This is a webinar that's sponsored by the National Health Council, and you see here all the logos of all of the uh, patient advocacy organization members of the National Health Council. We like to say that we represent the over 160 million people in the United States with at least one chronic disease or disability. And we we um, represent the voice of all those patients through their, through their member organizations. Next slide, please. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This webinar will be recorded and it will be available afterwards on the NHC website. All attendees are automatically muted and cannot unmute themselves. And so we ask that you submit your questions through the question and answer function. Next slide, please. We wanna acknowledge the hard work of our program committee. This, fund, this program has been funded through a, a contract from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute through their Eugene Washington Pecori Engagement Award. And the advisors that we've had with us um, guiding us through this project are Robert McBurney, Teresa Strong, Jennifer King, Debbie McCall, Lucinda Orsini, Jennifer Graff, Vanessa Bollinger, Rachel Dungan, D Dungan Susan Dos Reese, and Danielle Lavalley. Thank you to you all. Next slide, please. So we have been, um, ha we've had this series going for quite some time now. And as you can see, we have a lot of webinars that we've completed to date. And um, we will be doing an additional webinar on April 27th on diversity and representativeness in real world data sources. It's going to be moderated by Lisa Simpson, who's the CEO of Academy Health. Lisa is also on the NHC Board of Directors. And the presentation will be by Ziad Overmeyer from Blue Cross of California and also a professor at Berkeley. If you would like to register for that, you can go to the registration website that's uh, listed here on this screen and you can also join our mailing list. And um, the information about registration and the mailing list will also be placed in the chat so that you'll be able to see those after this slide disappears. Next slide, please. So um, we've completed our housekeeping and background and it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. As I mentioned before, Danielle Lavallee is um, on the, plant, the, the advisory committee for this project. Um, she's a very good friend to the National Health Council. Danielle is the Senior Director for the British Columbia Academic Health Science Research Network and Affiliate Associate Professor in the Department of Surgery and Health Services at the University of Washington. In her role, she works across the organization to foster a patient-oriented approach to research and learning health systems. Her research focuses on advancing methods to incorporate patient and stakeholder pers perspectives into both clinical care and research. Over the past 10 years, her work has focused on assessing diverse stakeholder experiences with technology-enabled approaches to supporting care. Danielle holds a Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of Kansas and a PhD in Pharmaceutical Health Services Research from the University of Maryland. Dr. Chung is a tenured Associate Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics and Associate Director of the Program on Health and Clinical Informatics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Medicine. She's an informa, informa I don't know if I can say this word correctly, an informatician um, and physician scientist and triple board certified in the medical specialties of clinical informatics, general pediatrics and general internal medicine. At UNC Health, she serves as the medical informatics director of digital health innovation and patient engagement, where she leads the design and implementation of novel technologies and patient strategy. She also is the Medical Director of Population Health Informatics for the UNC Health Alliance, UNC's Health Clinically Integrated Network. She is the Founding Director of the Clinical Informatics Subspecialty Fellowship Program at UNC Hospitals. So we have two quite accomplished experts who are gonna to talk to us about this topic today. And I'm gonna begin by handing it over to Dr. Lavallee, who is going to kick off the presentation. Uh, thanks, Eleanor, and I, I've accomplished step one of unmuting myself. Um, I am pleased to be here this morning because I'm calling uh, in from West Vancouver here in Canada. Um, so great to be here um, as part of today. 
uh, we have each, Arlene and I have 15 minutes to talk and I think we agree we could talk for hours about this. So in the time that I have, I'm just gonna share some um, thoughts I have about the value for patient report outcomes and some of the challenges that exist and some of the opportunities I think we have as a community um, to advance the work today. Next slide. I have no financial conflicts to disclose, but I once saw somebody present that they had intellectual conflicts. And I love that because I've, I've been thinking about this and working in this space for 10 years. So I think it would be remiss of me not to say, I'm sure I have biases that have, or, or experiences that have biased my um, opinions today. So I, I just wanna recognize that. Next slide. And then I also wanna acknowledge that one of the best things about my job is that I can't do it alone. And there are two particular projects that are, have informed a lot of the comments that I'm gonna make today. And those have been in partnership with a number of people. So one project is an agency for healthcare research and quality funded project, developing design principles to integrate patient reported outcomes into clinical practice. And the team members are listed there. And then we also were fortunate to have um, a Eugene Washington Engagement Award from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute um, that focused on the use of patient-generated health data inclusive of patient-reported outcomes. And that team included um, both patient partners and researchers as part of it. And Deb McCall, who is an advisor to this program, um, also sat on this project as well. So while um, I acknowledge that those are the, the things that influence me, I certainly want to indicate that those are not necessarily the views of the two funding organizations. Next slide. Okay, so um, the evidence has shown, we're just gonna jump right into patient report outcomes. And I suspect this won't be a surprise to anyone on the call today, but the evidence is demonstrating that patient reported outcomes inform care. Most importantly, we see great evidence at that, the patient level, where the information that's captured really can help inform decisions about care, understanding about um, how treatments improve outcomes or change outcomes as it were. But as we aggregate that data, we're also seeing opportunities to leverage patient reported outcome data and how we think about the care quality that's provided and delivered to patients. Um, as we look across populations, how are people experiencing healthcare, um, new treatments, new programs or care coordination initiatives that might be um, being played out, for example, or perhaps guiding where we need to target new interventions or new programs to help support um, patients who are receiving care. And then certainly at the payer and policy level, we're starting to see examples of how policy and payment decisions are influencing the capture of patient report outcome measures. So for example, I have the fortune of, of being involved in some work around total joint replacement. And part of that work expects the inclusion of um, data regarding uh, pa patient function uh, and pain as a result of total joint replacement. And that's part of uh, payment policy. So we're seeing it all at all different levels of the health. Next slide. Um, and, and so what we're seeing that value, it, one of the opportunities we had is to really talk to people within the healthcare system, patients, clinicians, and healthcare administrators to understand what is the value of capturing this data as it, as it relates to your respective experience. And at every stage of care delivery, if you will, at prevention, so how do we use uh, patient generator, patient report outcome data to, to focus on healthcare prevention? Um, are having to keep the health system at bay? How do we use this information as we figure out what is the right diagnosis or what are, what are the right treatments around a diagnosis? How do we maintain health? Um, or how do we decide when new interventions are needed? That continuum of care, um, there's, there's examples of how patient reported outcomes influence each of those steps. When we talked to patients and providers and health systems leaders, where we saw them coalesce is this data is incredibly important when it's actionable and it, and it really supports the discussions and the immediate care that is being provided or being um, assessed in terms of, of how well it's um, being, um, uh, being experienced by the patient. What, one of the things I found really interesting in the conversations, especially with patients and clinicians, was how patient-reported outcomes data really supported the shared language of what people were experiencing, especially as it related to new treatments. So instead of talking about how, how people were feeling when they could look at it together as shared data um, and, and the shared language, it helped drive the conversations in a more efficient and productive way. Um, so, so I thought that was a really interesting um, perspective um, for a way of framing patient report outcomes as the shared language for how people are, are talking about the care um, they're receiving. 
An interesting piece too from the health systems administ administration perspective is this idea that we know we're gonna need to continue to catch this information, but there's still this, this question of how do we do it? How do we do it efficiently? And how do we continually ensure that this information really is driving care forward in a way that, that should be uh, provided? So that gets me to my next slide which gets into some of the process things. Cause I think that while there's a lot of value, what my experience has been is really figuring out how do we do this? And what we have found is that one size doesn't fit all. So in the slide in front of you, there's examples of, um, from some work that we did when we were looking across our healthcare system to figure out who's capturing patient reported outcomes. And at the time we were doing this, it was all via pen and paper. And I give you the example of depression because that depression management screening is a universally recognized um, outcome that's important in all aspects of care delivery. And as we looked across different clinics, we saw that depression was being um, assessed, but using different measures. Um, so we had the PROMISE uh, depression scale being used for screening. Uh, we had the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale for Postpartum Depression Screening, Geriatric Depression Scale, PHQ2, which was being used as a screener, and that was actually part of contractual reporting. So you see these different uses and needs for the data, but using different measures. The challenge for that is twofold. Um, one, from a health systems perspective, to, to build and sustain in the technology space, it gets really challenging. But more importantly to me, from the patient experience, people come in and out of different doors of an organization. And if they're constantly interfacing with different questionnaires that seem kind of similar, it can represent a burden. So one example of that is one of the patient um, and family advisors that I um, spoke with as we were doing some of this work reflected that he was a transplant recipient. And so not was he receiving regular care in the transplant clinic, but he was also interfacing with the plastic surgery department because of, of um, post-operative complications. He was getting um, uh, help through our uh, um, psychiatry department as well. And every time he interfaced, he was experiencing patient report outcomes and other patient questionnaires, and it became burdensome. And it also felt sometimes like he was being asked the same questions, but information wasn't being shared. So when we think about the patient journey through the health system, we do have to think about some of these processes to make sure it feels seamless and streamlined. Next slide. So while there are challenges, I think opportunities do exist. And this is an opportunity for us when we start to think about the systems aspect to figure out how do we do this in a manner that really does support care, but also helps different decision makers throughout the care continuum use the information, get access to the information that they need to make the decisions that they need, that they need to make. So in our context, we looked at a single depression scale and started to look at all of the different uses. So as we, as we built out the, the measure of um, focus, we could build it to meet the needs of different stakeholders in the system. Um, this isn't always easy, right? The, the idea of finding a universal measure that fits all needs or interests. And I think that that's gonna be part of the conversations that have to happen. What are the common areas that we agree there are common measures that can help support different decisions? And then what are the areas where there are unique measures that are needed to, to really provide value added care to that individual, to the patient and inform different decisions? And how do we start to think about the ways in which we can build that in? So that'll go to my next slide. And I think that, that we have a lot of opportunities moving forward. I think in the early work of patient reported outcomes, we've seen that this the patient, um, patient reported data period is complementary to the data we already collect as part of clinical care. I would offer that new approaches are still needed, that patient report outcomes won't be the panacea we need it to be. We need new approaches recognizing the patient report outcome measures don't necessarily reflect always the ways in which people want to tell their healthcare story. I think that there's also this need to think about the different methods that might be, might be necessary to help pull this information out when um, we can't use a questionnaire for everything. So I think there's some really cool opportunities in natural language processing um, and ways in which we even think about the assessment of patient experience to help inform um, the decisions that we make. And then last, I think the, the, a huge opportunity is just making data access and linkages easier and better. And I think we're, as we start to see more around interoperability, we have that opportunity. Um, so one example, I have a um, paper here, the integration of registries with electronic health records to accelerate the generation of real world evidence. 
As I mentioned before, I have an opportunity to work in, um, in the space of total, total joint replacement. And Dr. Franklin, who leads is the lead on this particular article, is using a total joint replacement registry that the primary outcomes are patient reported outcomes across um, a national database to help pull that information along with clinical information to develop predictive models to help inform decisions between a patient and a surgeon around um, the right timing and approach to treatment for total um, for um, osteoarthritis. And so I think that is a really important um, way to think about data and data linkages because we know that we don't learn just as one single system, but we learn across systems and across experiences. And there's some very rich forms of um, data in data registries, as I'm sure many of you can appreciate, that we could be leveraging better. So how do we get there? Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna end on this um, piece in terms of the co-design required. I think we have a, such great places to go. And I know uh, Dr. Chung is gonna talk about some of the amazing work they're doing at UNC. I think as we continue to, to pick apart where we go from here, the concept of co-design is required. One of the things I really appreciated through the work that we've done is that um, while we were hyper-focused on patient-reported outcome measures, when you take a step back, you start to appreciate all the different types of information we request from patients increasingly, and COVID certainly, certainly has shown a bright spotlight on that using technology. Um, and, and how do we recognize the different ways in which we're um, connecting with patients digital, digital, digitally, asking them information, requesting information? How do we not only pull that in in a seamless way, but also feed it back so there's better access and better um, uh, uh, information and, and less burden to patients themselves. Um, so I end with this in terms of thinking about the co-design and um, the ways we can uh, improve care moving forward. So I'm going to um, close there. I'm happy to answer any questions um, and look forward to uh, Dr. Turner's presentation. Thanks. And this is such a great follow on to um, go next. And so thanks so much, Danielle. Um, it's really insightful. And I think every time I listen to you, even though we've known each other for a long time and commiserated <laughs> along some of the um, work in this area, I learn something new every day. So thank you for that. Um, so next slide, please. I really like Danielle's um, you know, conflicts. So I'm going to use that next time, but I have also received funding from several agencies and then UNC Health does have a collaboration with Apple Health, of which I'm part of as well. Next slide, please. I'd also would like to highlight our NIH funding. Um, this is more of a methods um, grant, but one in which we did do some qualitative work, which informs some of the work that we're presenting today. And similar to Danielle, um, it does not happen alone in an, on an island. And so I like to thank my team members and of course um, need to say that this is not representative of the NIH's views at all. And they are my own. Next slide. So for us, you know, I think, you know, Daniel's laid out some of the really great opportunities and benefits for PROs and also some of the challenges I think we're facing. And I'll tell you just a brief story about our PRO journey. And on the left, you know, you see this winding road, which I think many of us who do work in this area can kind of resonate um, with. But you know, our road has definitely been, you know, one where um, we've learned a lot. So it's really not about the destination, but it's about that journey of, you know, all the opportunities where we can improve care through the use of PROs. And I think, you know, we have a long ways to go still, but um, lots of things to do in this area. So I hope we plant, both of us hopefully have planted and I will plant um, some food for thought um, for future work for all of you on the call today. So next slide, please. For those of you who may not be from the States or from um, North Carolina, I did want to just highlight a little bit about UNC Health. We're the only public not-for-profit academic health system in the state of North Carolina, and you can see our state highlighted on the right. And all the blue dots and also that yellow dot are our 12 hospitals, and we have also over 650 clinics spread across um, North Carolina in specialty as well as primary care. You also probably noticed that most of our um, hospitals and most of our clinics also are all on a single electronic health record system and also the same patient portal. And that, you know, 
is a really huge benefit to how we deliver care and so important for PROs. And, you know, as Danielle also highlighted, you know, we need that data available. And so having a single record that everyone can view is really important. Um, we don't have it across every single place yet, but we have um, plans in place to move everyone um, onto EPIC at UNC. We additionally have all our administrative and billings and other support systems that are non-clinical all within the same systems as well. So that also provides some additional benefits. For us, um, all the millions of lives that we serve at UNC, We've had rapid growth um, from 2011 and onward, and this is really reflective of all the growth and um, acquisitions that we've had to better serve our citizens. So just want to provide that as our context. Next slide, please. So for us, I feel like this has been a very long time, but it's only been several years um, for our formal PRO investment and effort here at UNC. And this really started with a dedicated team of PRO experts um, that are experts in research as well as um, developing um, PRO specifically, um, as well as bringing together our operational innovation and our IT teams around this common purpose. And we really focused on building technical infrastructure and you know, part of that is leveraging the things that we have, and um, certainly we have the patient portal, as many of you all do, where our patients can collect these at home. But we also have other tools within Epic um, where we can have our patients, um, you know, either answer on their own um, at the point of care in the clinic by locking down the station and presenting a patient facing questionnaire, but also for our staff to be able to do that as well and enter that data on behalf of the patient as they ask them those questions. And of course, um, additionally, like those airport kiosks where you use to check in, um, we use those as well as tablets to collect that at the point of care, either at the front desk in the waiting room or the waiting areas, as well as in the clinic room. And I think one of the things that we noticed, you know, with these vendors and technologies is that you know, they're very focused on the visit and collecting these data specifically for that offense encounter. And we really realize that that's not enough for our patients and for the way that we want to deliver care. So we also have the ability to, you know, deliver questionnaires longitudinally, um, not tied to specific time points or not tied to specific visits, um, but also not tied to specific procedures, although that is also possible. So all our PROs, um, as I mentioned, because we are on a single vendor system, um, are available to all our users. So whether it's a social worker or a clinician such as myself, we all can see the same data, which is really important. We also have spent a long time and a lot of work um, developing trainings and implementation support guides for both our staff and our clinicians to effectively collect these PROs in a patient-centered um, manner, as well as to leverage these data and use them. And so a lot of time and effort has gone towards that. And additionally, we've focused a lot um, as well on EHR-based tools for decision support. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a future slide, but this is really important as well to make sure those data are being utilized. And um, I'll also highlight that all our data at UNC is used for the data warehouse for research as well. Next slide. So for us, you know, we've learned a lot along the way, but I think uh, one of the key drivers of this being a success, and I will say, you know, it's still a work in progress. We're not, we don't have all the answers for sure, um, is the institutional investment. So we have dedicated staff towards implementation coaching and QI resources for process improvement, IT analysts dedicated to PRO work and questionnaire work, um, as I mentioned, and also this is um, a painful and not a sexy topic, but governance is really, really necessary. And Danielle and I have commiserated around this topic many times, but it's just so important to reduce that duplication on the patient burden side and to make sure our patient's journey is, um, you know, we're not asking them for the same information at five different clinics as they seek care throughout that week. Um, it's really important for that, but also important for using that data Data downstream for research and improvement processes as well. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, of course, having local PRO subject matter expertise is so valuable. You know, it's very difficult to get consensus around what are the instruments we should use for a certain symptom domain like depression. And um, those are just very valuable resources. 
The other piece, um, which is also maybe not as sexy, but very important as well, and this definitely is, you know, the informatician and me um, talking, but, you know, data harmonization and standards are very important as well. Um, so collecting a certain instrument in one part of your business um, or one entity has to be the same as if you collected it somewhere else. And so having um, these data flow into the data warehouse, but also be mapped to common data models and terminologies and ontologies, just like a lab result would be such as LOINC, um, and we have a data model for PROs now through the Cornet. So these are evolving um, things in our community and lots more work is needed for sure. Um, but it's also very, very important to actually invest and in, ensure that your PRO data is actually flowing into your data wor research warehouse as well. Um, many institutions, surprisingly, they're collecting PROs but these data are not put into the research warehouse. And so this is just really critical, um, you know, elevating the importance of the patient experience and the symptoms, um, not just for that, but also so that we can, you know, take these data also and better inform our care and also better understand um, what happens to our patients as well as they go through our care journeys. We still have lots of work to do in that area as well. Um, next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about our experience and what um, we've learned to make PROs um, a little bit more successful, but I want to highlight some of the opportunities. And Danielle alluded to some of these already, so she was a good prelude for sure. Um, that easy access to results within the EHR for the clinical staff is just so important. Um, I myself as a physician, you know, as I see my patients, I definitely don't want to log into two or three different third party websites or apps or other places to be able to uh, access that PRO data. And so that is something that we've heard loud and clear and I think many now have um, done research in this area. And um, that is definitely something that resonates across all clinical communities. I think equally, um, we need to have those results available for our patients in the portal. You know, something that they can portal, you know, port around with them as they seek care at different places or as they move to different places. Um, and so that it's a longitudinal record for them also to refer back to and just not enough work done in this area. So many opportunities there. And just as we, you know, need assistance and tools to help us collect them, we need a lot of help with interpreting them as well. <laughs> so, you know, for most clinicians, our medical training does not actually teach you how to use or interpret PRO data. And so it's quite confusing for many people. They're very bright um, and you know, well-meaning, but we need help. So things like providing minimally important differences and cut points for severity. And then anytime there is the actual clinical action recommended or a pathway, you know, providing that data to help our clinicians is really important and helpful. And also along the same lines of that, just providing some quick visual cues. It could be color encoding or other ways that you, you know, bold it or other things where we really need like a quick and easy way to like point out or just pop out the stuff that's really important, right? The abnormal scores or big changes, um, that's really key and something so simple to do, but um, a lot of folks don't do in the EHR. So um, that's an opportunity to improve upon as well. And um, decision support is also really, really meaningful if and only if we insert it at the right times in the clinical workflow and have additional context and details for our clinicians. So I think this is um, an area that's ripe for innovation as well. We don't have the same types of tools for our patients and the patient facing tools like portals or personal health records. And so I think lots of opportunity there as well. And I'm, I'm sad to always you know, look at the lay of the land every time I do a talk like this and look for new tools um, in this space for patients. And um, yes, lots of work to do, everyone on this call. So um, I'm looking for um, many innovations to come in this area. Um, another quick thing that we found works very well to help is also providing some documentation shortcuts. So in Epic, they're called smart phrases or dot phrases, where we can actually populate the notes with the scores, but also highlight abnormalities or provide us other interpretive um, context as well, alongside clinical data that might be helpful, such as lab values. So that's something very easy to do, um, and most um, EHR systems are able to do, um, but not utilized as much as they should be. The other, um, the last two things I'll highlight are, you know, it's important to get the single 
time point scores, right? So we can interpret them quickly at the clinic visit, but also we need that context, right? As we collect our peers, particularly in you know, our chronic conditions or post procedures like with total joint replacement, we also need to be able to see those scores longitudinally. And you know, honestly, like line graphs are pretty good, um, but we still have lots of opportunities to make that better and have more context um, with other parts of the patient's um, record and important um, events and stuff that happen as well. Um, and I'll, lastly, you know, this is an area where I think most um, vendors are providing this from the EHR side of things, but population level dashboards are also very helpful. So you want to be able to filter down to the practice level or the hospital um, specialty level or group practices um, and so forth. And you really want to be able to see, you know, how are we doing with collecting these PROs? You know, are we actually improving our care or how are we doing um, with quality of care? And without those real-time dashboards, it's quite difficult to extract and look at that data um, over time. So that's something to definitely invest in and lots of opportunities there as well. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a very simple example of depression. Um, and it's, this is a PHQ-9, which is a commonly used instrument. And as you'll see here, this is just a table of you know, the responses to each of the questions. You can quickly see the color coding um, in yellow as well as red text, noting the abnormal responses. And just very easy to do, but um, you know, can be very helpful for interpretation. Next slide, please. So I talked to you a little bit about what's happening um, as well in terms of opportunities and maybe some of the challenges, but I want to look to the future as well and plant some seeds and food for thought. Um, you know, we have a lot of technologies coming out. I'm sure there are others that we've just not imagined yet, but, you know, these can be, you know, leveraged and utilized um, for the collection of PROs and for the delivery of these results, I think. Chatbots are artificial um, intelligence-based um, conversational agents, voice assistants like Siri or Amazon Alexa. You know, these are all tools that we can leverage and some are already doing so, but it really does help to create a more accessible experience for some of our patients, particularly those who might be visually impaired. And also just, um, you know, interacting with something like um, through voice um, or through a conversation seems a lot less, um, I don't know, artificial than, you know, answering a piece of paper on the form, at least from some patient insights that we've gathered. So um, I really encourage folks to look at um, using and leveraging some of these new tools. Additionally, you know, hospital, um, hospitalized patients who can't get up out of bed, who may have some, you know, um, accessibility or, um, you know, digital, um, uh, I am blanking on this word, but you know, the dexterity is not there when you're critically ill. These voice assistants can also be used in the hospital setting to collect their symptoms um, as well. So um, this is a really exciting area. I think we're gonna see a lot um, to come. The next, Daniel also alluded to, but machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, my own team has been doing work in this area in terms of using NLP and machine learning based um, tools to extract symptoms from narratives. So um, as it's you know, been you know, very clearly um, articulated to us from our patient community, it's really important for our patients to be able to tell us in their own words and in their own voice what their symptoms are and what they're experiencing. And one of um, our research projects actually looked at a clinical trial monitoring for adverse events. And we invited patients to submit any length of a free text narrative of other symptoms they might be experiencing beyond those that are elicited for that clinical trial specifically. And we found that many, 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 like a majority of patients want to submit something and are willing and able to do so. And the most important thing I think we've learned so far in some of this early work is that they submit many, many symptoms that are actually not assessed in the trial-specific questionnaires. So, so many opportunities that we're missing to address many of the addressable symptoms, um, things like constipation, which we could readily address clinically, um, to some that are a little bit harder, like fatigue, where you know, there's not as much I can do as a physician for that. But, you know, just a lost opportunity, I feel like, and lots of opportunity for innovation in this area. We can mine patient portal notes or messages, um, telephone transcriptions of phone calls that come in to formally collecting some of these data um, from our patients too. So lots of opportunity there. The other is um, one that has a lot of hype around it, but I'm hoping comes to bear in my lifetime in the next five to 10 years, which is 
prediction, right? So we all are excited about machine learning and AI applied to predict adverse events and symptoms. And this really opens up the possibility for not only better understanding what these look like for lots of different patients, um, it can be different for many. And right now we just don't have like, that nuanced of an understanding to really answer the questions. I feel like I get a lot in clinic that I can never answer. Um, and so, you know, they wanna know what's it gonna be like if I choose this treatment versus another and you know what, uh, what have patients experienced like me over their longitudinal treatment journey and you know we're getting there um, but we just don't have all those answers and so my hope is that we're going to be able to leverage larger sets of these PRO data you know more collection of you know free text and other ways that we capture the actual patient voice in their own words because it is really different um, and more um, rich I feel like than sometimes the questionnaires that we use today for PRO assessments. And we want to be able to tell those patients what it's going to be like. So, I, you know, my hope is that this informs just-in-time interventions to prevent worsening of symptoms or to re prevent other complications. And I think, you know, beyond the insights it delivers and in, to inform treatment decisions, you know, we're hoping that obviously it improves our patient journey um, all throughout as well. So I wanna highlight um, FDA Project Patient Voice if you've not heard of it. So this is um, an active project in the area of visualization and presentation of PRO AE data, um, of course, in the clinical trial setting for cancer therapies um, as our first rollout. But this is a really nicely done website. It's still in early development, but it shows the clinician facing views across you know, AEs from the clinical trials that inform um, that treatment regimen to a patient facing view as as well that clinicians and patients can share together and discuss treatment options for. So um, really exciting. Um, please check it out as well. I am not involved in that project, but um, just believe in the spirit of it and hope that there are more of that to come. And um, next slide, please. So my last um, little uh, mantra will be that my hope is that PIRA has really changed the paradigm of care. So you know, my hope is that PROs become just as equally important and elevated to the level of things like labs and vital signs, and that we also move away from just thinking about collecting PROs at the office visit or maybe on the phone or, you know, when the patient reaches out or, you know, they're coming in for care, but really meeting our patients um, where they're at, um, wherever they may be at, at home or wherever, um, to meet them virtually, to be able to collect this data more in real time using other modalities such as wearables and sensor data in addition to asking them questions about their symptoms and to be able to hopefully finally deliver that insight back, um, including predictions um, both to clinicians and patients so that we can really help improve um, and inform care. So um, with that, my next slide is just some PRO resources. And um, one is the paper that I just mentioned, but just some awesome um, other resources from Picori and some from um, that Danielle has also led. These are just great resources if you're just um, new to pre-ROs or new to trying to implement them. Um, so I highly encourage you to check those out. And just thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much to both of you. We have uh, uh, lots of questions coming into the chat and into the Q&A, so I'm gonna jump right into them so that we can get right to them. Um, the first question is asking about the common uh, mediums where pro data are collected, such as clinical trials and registries. And, um, and, but I think probably the meat of the question is, what could we do um, to better align how different healthcare stakeholders are designing and collecting pro data since they are, it is coming out of different places in terms of sometimes registry, sometimes clinical trials, sometimes healthcare. How can we think about alignment so that there's a commonality in what's being used and that we can ensure that maybe there's some standardization and that people are using appropriate questions and appropriate answer response choices? Either one of you wanna jump on that if you've given any thought? Arlene, do you want to take a first pass? I'm happy to as well. Oh, you can go for it first, please. You know, uh, I I think this is this is going to governance. Um, this is a big issue, and I it, it's not a big issue. I think it's a it, it's going to require a community effort and understanding what are the decisions that people need 
and what data do they need to make the decisions that, that they, they plan to make? And I think um, there are a couple of challenges. Um, one being that for a long time, patient report outcomes have lived in the research world. Um, I once heard somebody say that two trains left the station at the same time. One that we know that this is important data. The other one of we have no idea exactly how this informs care and, and decisions. So there's a lot of research still being developed in what is the right time and context for using these measures and when is it valuable data and when is it just noise? And so I think that as we continue to develop evidence on in which context is this data helpful, we have to be able to feed that into decisions that are being made at other levels around policy, around uh, quality improvement, population health, et cetera. So I think that this is gonna be a, common, a continuous challenge as the evidence develops. Uh, but we have to have pathways for sharing that information. So, so that's one point. And I think the other part is really figuring out how do we come to, consensus is a tricky word, but how do we all agree that these are the important domains of care and these are the best measures to use? And in what context do we need specific measures that really are gonna inform decisions? So I think in, in terms of the FDA and the, the evidence for new treatments and new, uh, new drugs, for example, there's very specific data that has to be presented to make sure this, is, this drug is safe and effective. That, that type of information may look different than what's needed at the clinical level to know this patient is getting better after a, a device or treatment. There should be, there should be commonalities between these two, um, but I think it's going to take broader teams of people that are looking at this from different lenses. So, um, so I think community is going to be important as well as pathways for doing research and feeding that into actual decision making. Eileen, I don't know what else you, you might add, or Eleanor, certainly you're an expert in this space too. Arlene, anything to add? Oh, I think Arlene might be having a bandwidth problem. Um, looks like she might be frozen there. So I'll just jump in with a few comments. We actually have a project that's going on um, in the National Health Council right now that we think in the long term could be helpful to a question like this. Um, we, we would like to see the development of, um, uh, of some standardized patient-centered core impact sets and um, that if we can get everyone focused on a standardized set that everyone's agreed on, I think Arlene had to drop out and she's gonna come back. Um, if we get everyone focused on a standard set that's agreed on, um, especially one that's being been driven by the patient community where they've determined what are the most important things that patients care about, um, then at least everyone's singing from the same hymnal. They're all starting from the same place. And even though there may be tools that of course, as you mentioned, they've gotta be appropriate for the use and FDA refers to that as fit for purpose as well as other people. So if it's appropriate for the use, it may mean it requires a little bit of tweaking for that use, but at least you know everyone's going after the same target. Um, and that is something that's important to us to see happen. So let's jump to the next question. Um, uh, Danielle, you mentioned the phrase shared language. Could you talk a little bit about, and I see Arlene is back, so welcome back, Arlene. Um, Danielle, could you talk a, a little bit more and elaborate on shared language? Yeah, happy to. So what was, um, in that context, it was the, um, the person that we were speaking to was actually a patient. We heard this similarly from clinicians, that they had been saying, I've been having pain um, outside of the times that I'm seeing you at different times of the day. And they finally went back and tracked, it was around headaches. They used an app to track the pain and the headaches and the timing. And when they brought it back, that was the first time that the, they felt their clinician really heard them and was like, oh, cause now we're looking at a spreadsheet together. And that's a language that person could get behind, but it was reflective of the experience that person was having. And, and we heard that similarly from clinicians, that there was this excitement about being able to look at something together, oftentimes what people were bringing in and then figuring out, okay, what's happening at these different time points. We heard it in sports medicine too. Um, you know, when people are used to running, when are they having pain? What is their distance of like? Cause they can start to correlate information. So that's how it became a shared language that they were looking at reported symptoms, reported pain, but in a context, I think helped facilitate conversation. Um, so that was, that was kind of the, the shared language piece. They were looking at the same thing and now talking about the same thing. And that's why patient engagement at the beginning is so vital to be sure that the words that are being used are the correct words that the patient would use that the patient understands. I mean, there are some classic examples of this in drug development where a company may have spent a lot of money investing in a clinical trial where they asked questions about pain 
And, um, and so the therapy was effective on the biomarker, but it didn't show any difference in pain. And when they actually talked to patients about why, why didn't your pain go away, even though you're, you know, your biomarker, the patient said, well, I, I never really had any pain. And the patient didn't describe what they were experiencing as pain. They described it as discomfort and uh, a bloated feeling, an uncomfortable feeling, but they weren't in pain. So that's why pain didn't change. There never was any. So it's, a, it's a definitely an example of the importance of patient engagement and having that conversation about language and words and being sure the right words are being used. Um, I, we have another question that's come in about um, the res it's resource intensive to engage patients and to, um, to collect pro data over time. Suggestions that you might both have about how you can do this in a less burdensome, less resource intensive way. You both mentioned technology and talked a lot about technology. Um, anything that you'd wanna to react to and what you think is some of, the, some of the most exciting things that you're seeing in um, efficiency, effectiveness, relieving burden and, and making this doable. Arlene, would you like to jump in? Sure, I can't, so sorry that I had technical issues. My <laughs> internet provider is not as stable as one would wish. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of different, um, gosh, it's, it's a really challenging area, I think. This is where I feel like the machine learning and AI could also be helpful um, in that, you know, we're doing really a lot better in terms of asking less questions to get at, you know, the symptom and the severity through, you know, um, a lot of our psychometric methods. Um, so that's one way. I think, you know, using tools where, you know, we're not asking a 20 question questionnaire when we have, you know, adaptive um, method where we can ask one question or two or three and get at the same answer. I think, you know, that's really um, important. And one that I think uh, many folks who are not familiar with PROs don't realize are, are out there. Um, the other is, you know, I think the challenge with the trials and, you know, the research context is often our patients um, have one condition in those settings or it's, you know, to treat a certain condition or target that. And in reality, our, our patients um, don't live in the vacuum of having just one chronic condition, right? Um, and this is where I think this burden, you know, the patients who are burdened with the most, um, you know, symptoms and who have the most conditions and the most to manage are those who are going to get like bajillion PROs asked and thrown at them, right? And this is where I think, you know, uh, a combination of patient input on what's most important to them and what's changed um, through some interactive, you know, mechanisms where we collect more day-to-day um, -day data um, when it's meaningful to the patient, combined with machine learning and just being able to predict what we need to ask about at the right moments for that patient are my kind of future hope um, to get at reducing that burden, um, both also from the clinician side, but also from the patient side, you know, balancing what are the most important things I need to know about clinically? Because um, I feel like that's important to the monitoring of their health for their different conditions. Um, but also, you know, really bringing up um, as a very important priority what's most important to the patient because something that's very severe to them may actually not be, you know, from the score level, maybe looking really um, scary, right, from a clinical side. But to them, that's not their most important symptom, right? And so how can we just be smarter um, through using technology to target those things, I think is sort of my hope. Great, great. Um, we're actually out of time. And I wanna thank you both for such a great presentation. Um, I also wanna apologize because someone in the audience had asked for us to turn closed caption on and we were not able to do that. We, we reached out to our technical people to help us because it wasn't turning on. And um, we got an answer back that once the webinar has started, you can't turn the, that seems like, an, that doesn't seem like an appropriate answer. It certainly seems like we should have been able to turn it on. So we're going to investigate that, but I do apologize. I wanted to let the people who requested that know that we did try to do it, but um, our, our IT people couldn't help us get it turned on. And we really do apologize for that. Um, if, if any, we're, um, I don't know if the, if the two speakers have a moment to take on a couple more questions, I'm willing to do that if you have the time and other people who need to drop off, go right ahead and drop off because we have passed our, our, our set time. Um, maybe one more question. Sure. Um, there are, um, uh, I think but there was an interesting question that was asking about the challenges that you've both experienced in integrating pro 
questionnaires and data collection when it comes to clinical records and EHRs and things like that? What are some of the challenges that you've seen that you've had to overcome? So many challenges. <laughs> you go first, Danielle. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that the challenge that I have seen with EHRs are twofold. One, they're never fully implemented. They're constantly evolving in terms of their abilities. And, um, and so I think working in that environment of change uh, is, is tricky, right? Because if you, um, it, yeah, it's that part is just challenging uh, because what you need to change based on what you're learning in a changing environment is challenging to implement. That aside, I think the ability for technology to be adaptable right now, I think this will change, but like you capture one measure, how do you make sure that the, the data is scored and put into an appropriate place? So one of the things that we found early on is that we had um, from a paper standpoint, if you think about the questionnaire that you're looking at, it could be three pages long. Within those three pages, maybe patient questions about vaccine history, for example, and then the next five questions are a PRO measure that you as a person filling it out don't recognize, but when it goes on the backside, it should score and turn into actionable data. It's easy to do on paper. When you build that into a computer, it's hard for them, or the into the, some of the EHRs, it's hard for them to break that specific questionnaire out and then put that score where it needs to go into a set a data point. So I've, I have appreciated having informaticists at the table from the very beginning, as well as patients to say, what is the end goal with the data and how do we design with that end goal in mind versus saying, hey, can you build this? And they do, but it doesn't function the way we need it to be. So, so I think sometimes it's a, it's a matter of how our teams work and how, how we talk about similar things using different languages that produce absolutely different results. So I think that's been one of the biggest challenges um, to me. Um, and I think a great opportunity I've seen change in our health systems. I mean, we have an informatician um, which sounds both exciting and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I think we're seeing more of those skill sets um, emerge um, in our systems. So Arlene, I don't know what you would add, but that's quick. Answer. Oh yeah, the, I mean, I agree with 100% of what you have said. I think the other, um, I guess the other biggest challenge, and it, it's definitely colored by my lens of doing this informatics work myself, but you know, the systems like the portal and the EHR interfaces um, where we present those results and all the data are just uh, limited, you know, and have constraints. And so my hope is that is opened up further so that we can innovate um, across both the patient space and the clinician space. Great. Well, thank you both so much. We really appreciate it. And we want to thank the audience for hanging with us. I mean, even though we were to have ended um, at least over five minutes ago, we still have more than half the audience hanging on with us. So thank you to all of you. And um, uh, please, by all means, connect with us again for our next uh, webinar, which is next week. And we hope to see you there.